Uh, but let's uh, return uh, to the uh, academic session uh, and look at research in the field of payments. Uh, the logistics are the same as for the entire conference, i.e. Uh, 30 minutes for the presenter, 10 minutes uh, for the discussant, and 5 minutes Q&A afterwards. If you have questions, please uh, kindly put them uh, in the chat. Hence, let's uh, move straight to the session. Uh, there is an important link between payments and money markets as safe and efficient operation of payment systems has a strong bearing on the smooth implementation of monetary policy and respective money market conditions. This does not only apply for traditional payments, but also innovative endeavors in that field. I'm therefore very happy that we will cover both fields in this session. The first paper analyzes uh, tools to stabilize the exchange rate between stable coins and fiat currencies. And the second paper analyzes payment behavior in the Federal Reserve's RDGS system in an area of ample reserve. So without any ado, I would like to warmly welcome Ye Li, who will present the paper on money creation in a decentralized finance, a dynamic model of stable coins and crypto shadow banking. Ye Li is Assistant Professor of uh, Finance at U uh, Ohio State University, Fisher College of Business. The discussant afterwards will be Jean-Charles Roger, Professor of Banking at Geneva School of Economics and Management and Senior Chair at the Swiss uh, Finance Institute. Hence, I would like to uh, immediately hand over to uh, Ye Li for your presentation. Please. All right, so I guess I have 30 minutes and uh, uh, okay, it's a joint work with uh, um, Simon Mayer. Uh, Simon is now doing his postdoc at Booth and he will be joining uh, HSC Paris uh, next year. Uh, so I'm, I'm very grateful for the organizers to include this paper uh, in the program. Uh, so far, I have been learning a lot. Uh, I myself not only work on a macro finance fintech, but also on the payment system areas. Uh, so. This paper uh, is, is really a, about a uh, dynamic model of stable coin. We want to describe uh, what are the opti optimal strategies of a stable coin issuer. And uh, through the lens of the model, uh, we want to talk about optimal regulation. Uh, and also, we want to utilize this, this model to think about the incentives behind uh, this stable coin initiatives led by uh, global networks like Facebook, JP Morgan, etc. So. It's a very ambitious project. We try to do a lot. Uh, uh, hopefully, I can I can get through a lot of results. Uh, and uh, in this space, actually, we don't have a lot of papers. Um, you know, to 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 save some time, uh, I didn't include a literature review in this presentation. But in our paper, uh, we did try to cover uh, all related papers. Um, so let me motivate the study a little bit, uh, because here we are, you know, digressing a little bit away from the traditional system of payment. Uh, we all know that that, that there is a uh, blockchain-based uh, uh, financial architecture that is emerging. Uh, it includes banking, brokerage, exchanges. Basically, try to build an alternative financial system that can facilitate the, the transfer of value uh, in, the, in the crypto space. Uh, and we know that uh, any financial system needs some safe asset. Uh, and in the crypto world, uh, basically, we need it for two main purposes at this moment. Uh, there is a significant amount of uh, portfolio rebalancing activities between stablecoin and the rest of the volatile crypto. Uh, and also the owners of crypto often they pledge their uh, crypto assets as collateral to borrow stable coins uh, for payments. You know, they may use these stable coins to buy other crypto, further leveraging up their exposure, or they may use these stable coins to buy uh, services and uh, NFT, you know, things that they like. All right, so it's a uh, uh, it's a booming space, uh, but we we really don't have a good understanding of the uh, the strategies deployed by the stablecoin issuers. What are the key issues? And first foremost, uh, can these stablecoins maintain a relatively stable exchange rate with respect to the reference currencies? And the key issue involving stablecoin management is the management of reserves. Therefore, as I present the model, you will see a lot of uh, similar, similarities between uh, our model and the models of corporate liquidity management, but different from corporate liquidity management. Here, the stablecoin issuers liabilities, those are the stablecoins, 
uh, they can debase. It's almost like a country can inflate a way, modifies, quote unquote, their uh, currencies. So it's different. It's related to corporate liquidity management problem, but it's different. And also uh, regarding the debasement, uh, the fact that uh, uh, you know the the debt holders, the stable coin holders, they basically can do some risk sharing with the issuers. Uh, you may think of uh, uh, Coco, uh, but it's different because uh, this stable coin debasement is not uh, uh, predefined. You know, there are there are not any trigger events. Uh, it's it's quite arbitrary. Uh, it happens exposed uh, often to the uh, to the interest of the stablecoin issuer. So we are going to characterize all that. Um, all right. So just to give you a, a basic sense, of which are the major stablecoins on the market? Uh, this is the graph underneath here, uh, and you can see that the run up of stablecoin issuance uh, quite uh, uh, mirror the run up of both crypto lending and the growth of uh, decentralized exchanges. Those are the top two panels. Um, as I said before, uh, you, when you develop a new financial system, um, you know, I mean, it's not like new conceptually, it's just uh, based on blockchain, right? It's based on decentralized ledgers. Uh, this new system needs uh, some safe assets. Um, you know, there are papers, for example, from uh, Gary Gordon and co-authors, Arguing that the safe asset share uh, in a financial system relatively stable, we probably see something similar here as the whole DeFi space grows, the stable coin volume, uh, the total issuances uh, just go up. So, what are the research questions? As I said before, uh, you know, if if you read all these articles scattered here and there, you see there are a variety of strategies deployed by stable coin issuers. They do open market operations, for example, they hold a dollar assets and they use that to trade against the stable coin the issue so that the, the, the stable coin price is pegged at one dollar right um typical thing that you see for example in the foreign exchange market intervention and then they also sometimes charge the stable coin users some collateral requirement some margin requirement that serve as the first line of defense and of course the second and last line of defense will be the reserves held by the issuer themselves and then uh, the stablecoin issuers often charge fees on the users uh, and maybe give them some, some subsidies because there's a network effect. If, if there are more people use these stablecoins, this will stimulate further adoption. Uh, so, so maybe fees can turn into subsidies. It's something we also want to re uh, capture. There are also repegging activities. Uh, basically, the stablecoin is pegged at $1 per share, and then it is adjusted to $0.5 per share after uh, some debasement period. But also going to try to rationalize this phenomenon. And then there's the issuance of secondary units, uh, which we will interpret as the uh, as the equity issuance of the stablecoin issuer. I'm going to elaborate more on that later. You will see what's the point of issuing secondary units. So on the theoretical front, what we char uh, characterize is really a form of agoric instability here. So basically, uh, this uh, fixed exchange rate with the reference currency can last for a long time without anything of instability. Uh, but once the debasement starts, there is a slippery slope and the debasement can last for quite a long time. So there's a bimodal distribution of the states of the world here. Some key ingredients that, that contributes to this um, uh, behavior is the first and foremost, well, the, on the money demand side, right, the stablecoin issuers, they really value safety. You can motivate the safety preference from the aversion to information sensitivity because as we all know, if you want to create some asset that can circulate uh, this asset better deter information acquisition so that transaction counterparties do not have asymmetric information, you know, uh, they do not have uh, this concern over being adversely selected. Uh, so, uh, you know, we write a continuous time model that will help us to characterize fully the dynamics, especially the bimodal distribution of states. Uh, there are some earlier works in this area. Um, uh, Professor Roche also has a paper, I think it's uh, uh, dated 2013, sorry for the title. Um, so, I mean, if you think about it, it's not just a theoretical exercise, right? The first bullet point here, we think is very practical because we rationalize these strategies. We show you how to optimum, optimally implement it. It's very helpful for the practitioners. And right now, Sam and I, you know, sometimes we get some requests from the practitioners kind of asking us how to implement these ideas practically. But also here, this key theoretical insight, this agoric instability is also very useful because as you will see, how this can help us predict debasement and the recovery of a stable coin back to the peg. 
uh, we are going to talk about more applications in regulation and also why uh, large platforms like Facebook want to issue stable coin and whether they can uh, successfully maintain the stability, stability of their stable coin. And we are going to focus on over collateralized stable coin. Uh, there is one motivation is the recent proposal in the US Congress uh, that basically tried to outlaw on the collateralized stable coin. Uh, and another reason is that uh, uh, there are some recent events. Uh, some I'm not going to uh, see specific uh, crypto names. There are several of them, uh, but under collateralized, like under collateralized stable coins, of course, they are subject to rents. And uh, there have been some disasters. Famous people like Mark Cuban lost a lot of money in that. Uh, and I think there are tremendous thought on under collateralized, under collateralized stable coins. So our focus is on over collateralized ones. And we think we are the first paper that can really provide a uniform a theoretical framework to address all the issues on this slide. All right, so uh, you can think about stablecoin issuance as a form of shadow banking, uh, very simple. I'm going to present a simple model in panel A here. So basically, the holders of the secondary units, also called governance tokens, they act as a junior share, the equity share, they will take the loss if the reserve asset declines in value. Um, but also there are fancier, more complicated structure. Uh, basically, the stablecoin issuer requires the users to maintain some collateral and maintain a margin requirement uh, that can buffer the first uh, loss. But if the loss is too large, then it, it is up for the platform to uh, to bear the loss. All right. So we are going to, uh, when, today I don't have time to show you how to extend the basic framework to incorporate this more complicated structure but it is in the paper, hopefully I get some time to talk about the results regarding the dynamic optimal margin requirement. All right, but the focus is on panel A here uh, in terms of the model structure. So uh, a key object is going to be the indulgence uh, token price, a token meaning the stable coin. So just, you know, it's a shorter word just to save much more time. Uh, the price of equilibrium price, PT, is going to follow a diffusion process. Uh, the shock, DZT, is a standard Browning shock. Uh, I'm going to introduce on the next slide, right? But the equilibrium, the, the drift and diffusion, mu and sigma of the uh, price process is going to be uh, indulgently determined. Of course, it depends on the open market operations. Uh, there will be a, a unit mass of risk neutral representative users of the stable coin. Uh, if you look at what they want to maximize, DT after DT, right? Uh, the last term is very simple. They want to maximize the excess return, right? Their wealth is growing on the rate of R, and uh, and they want higher excess return, the better. But the first three terms, I'm going to explain a little bit here. The first term within the first three terms, what we call the transaction utility, is really a money utility specification. It's a textbook treatment. You have the real balance UIT in the utility function, and UIT is the dollar value of the stable coin, not the nominal units, the dollar value. And to capture the network effect, uh, which showed up, for example, in studies of multi-sided network and also monetary economics and social interaction, we have this NT, which is basically the integral of UIT over I, the aggregate dollar value of the stable coin holdings. This NT also comes into the, uh, the specification so that when we change the parameter alpha, we basically adjust the degree of network effects uh, of this payment system. And this A parameter just represents the quality or productivity of this payment system, how good it is. And later on, we are, we are going to indulgenize it uh, in an extension that will speak to uh, why the platform want to build a stable point pay payment system and how they can accumulate transaction data and improve this A uh, later, much later. And the second term is just the fees, the uh, all the subsidies in case FT is negative, uh, the stable point issuers charges the users. And the last term is the safety preference. So if you look at this uh, this uh, system here, right, the innovation of information is really the Browning shock. And the loading of the token price on the Browning shock is really what we call the information sensitivity. Whether it's a positive loading or negative loading, it's um, it's not something that uh, uh, money demand side will like. They want safety, and that's how we model it. The absolute, absolute value will enter into the utility, uh, sigma p, and uh, multiplied by the safety preference param parameter, eta. Uh, they enter there negatively, uh, and that is basically how we, uh, how we model the uh, safe asset demand. All right, so what about the stable coin issuers? We talk about the users, the issuers, the management reserve, uh, and here, let me clarify this NT is really the integral, the aggregate demand 
equilibrium is equal to the dollar value of the aggregate supply, ST being the supply and PT being the dollar price of the token, right? We want PT to be pegged at one. That's what we want. But we will show you debasement patterns. So under a constant money velocity, of course, this is a strong assumption. Uh, some blockchain protocols uh, fit this description, some do not, okay? Uh, but if you uh, adopt this assumption, then the transaction volume and the total dollar uh, holdings of stablecoin NT are proportional, so we impose a maximum throughput on NT. Uh, there are revenue sources, the, the reserve will earn a yield, R, uh, and also uh, the platform can earn some trading profits through open market operations um, by changing the supply, right, the DST. DST can be positive, issuing more stable coins, DST can be negative, buying back stable coins and burn them, send them to irretrievable uh, address, basically destroy them. Uh, and then uh, there is uh, some shock to the reserve balance. Uh, the shock is proportional to the outstanding amount of stable coin. You can think about this as related to cyber attack, operational risk in general, but also there are, can be shocks to the reserve asset itself. Later on, when we uh, remember the panel A, panel B, so later on when we extend the model, assuming the users also have to post collateral, then the shock will originate from the collateral value that users post and the risk exposure will be endogenized. Here it's exogenous, it's sigma, right? Later on, when we extend the model, the risk exposure will be dependent on the optimal margin requirement. So I think I've already spent uh, 15 minutes here. I'm going to uh, speed up a little bit. I'm going to selectively talk about some results. Uh, all right, but let's finish the, uh, the model setup first. Uh, we also have the fee revenues entering into the, uh, the reserve evolution. And also, uh, the reserves can be uh, reduced if the pl platform or the issuer decides to pay the owners of the governance tokens. Remember, they are literally the equity uh, owners. They are almost like the shareholders of this uh, platform. And uh, if you pay out dividend, of course, you are going to reduce the reserves. And the issuer will want to maximize uh, basically the shareholders value, the value of governance token. Of course, this will be the value function here that we later saw. Uh, we think our paper also provided the valuation framework uh, of for governance token because uh, the value function is really just the, the present value of all the payouts to the governance token holders. And we allow this dividend process to be any process. We are going to characterize the optimal design. Right now, in the stablecoin space, the design of uh, uh, governance token payout is very arbitrary. Okay, uh, But here, we are going to talk about what is the optimal design. So we are going to characterize a Markov equilibrium, and this equilibrium will have the excess reserves as the state variable. So excess reserves is the reserve minus the dollar value of the stablecoin liabilities. And our focus on over collateralization basically suggests that once CT, the excess reserve, falls to zero, that's when the issuer does not uh, have more reserves than outstanding stablecoin liabilities, that's when liquidation happens. Uh, we can allow C to go negative, but as you know, once C goes negative, then all this issue of coordination failure, bank rent, come back into picture, and this just confounds the model mechanism, right? So our focus on over collateralization is not only motivated by recent regulatory de development and recent events, but also, you know, we want to keep a relatively clear theoretical framework. All right, so the because it's a Mark Pauling's problem, right? And, and the only state variable is access reserve. All the indulgence variables will be a function of that, including the token price or the exchange rate. Uh, a key question is to what extent it is stable, right? But before I dive into the results, one important insight from this paper is that, well, if reserve is the key state variable here, it's better for the issuers to disclose their reserves. And right now there is a huge debate, especially surrounding Tether, uh, what is the value of the, their reserves? They claim that, that they invest a lot of their reserve portfolio into high quality bonds who issue those bonds. Nobody knows. And right now, there are some new stablecoin uh, initiatives that try to work with a chain link, which is a blockchain oracle system to try to uh, basically bring offline audited information on reserve value onto the blockchains so that people can actually make decisions regarding the stable coins based on uh, the audited and uh, and, and the blockchain based uh, reserve value. So we do some see some development uh, kind of consistent with our model focus on reserve is driving a lot of things uh, here. 
as I said before, right, the value function is basically the uh, present value of future uh, payout to governance token holders. And the HGB equation will solve it. I don't have time to talk about the boundary conditions, but it's guaranteed by the optimality of choosing the payout boundary. Of course, it's the upper bar, right? That's when the uh, reserves are uh, abundant, uh, and that's when you start to pay the governance token holders. Of course, when the reserves are low, you want to survive, right? You are not going to pay out. Uh, all right. So. Uh, the the value function takes uh, this particular form. So basically, uh, with within this indulgence upper bound defined by the optimal payout, the marginal value of the reserve is larger than one. Uh, here we basically assume there's a, a liquidation once C hits to zero. Right? You can think about this as an extreme financial distress scenario. It's a dynamic continuous time model. So at any point in time, the marginal value of C, taking into consideration all the future passes. And a lot of passes leads to the, 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 the liquidation region. So marginal value of reserve larger than one really suggests a strong incentive to do precautionary saving. And only at the payout boundary, that's when the marginal value of reserve is equal to one, meaning that $1 inside of the H year's balance sheet and $1 paid outside doesn't make any difference. That's when the precautionary saving motive is shut down. All right. So you can calibrate the model. You can you can fix some parameters to reflect some particular blockchain protocol, uh, and and then basically the model will give you a reserve contingent valuation of the governance tokens. So what about the key question of debasement versus PAG? Right. So we prove that there exists a C delta marked by this uh, dash line here, and if the re excess reserve is below this value, then that's when you have debasement. And the lower the reserve gets, the more information sensitive the, or the more volatility the token price has. And uh, of, uh, also, there's a slippery slope of debasement. So basically, as C declines, uh, the, the first derivative will decline even further. Okay, I'm going to show this on the very next slide. But once the excess reserve is above this, uh, this C delta uh, threshold, uh, that's when you see perfect uh, stability. So the key mechanism is that we have a, almost a sufficient statistic based on the value function here. You can think about this as the value function based uh, risk conversion, quote unquote, risk conversion parameter. Uh, remember, in the objective function, right, the shareholders or the governance token holders, they are risk neutral. But because of the threat of liquidation, financial distress, then you have indulgence risk conversion. And that is declining in the amount of financial slack, meaning the excess reserve. So that's what's really driving things here. So I talk about the uh, the slippery slope of debasement. Here is the panel B, right? So as the as the reserve level goes down, you see you, you can maintain a stable uh, value initially, but then it just collapses. And uh, what what is driving that? So now let's think about the open market operation uh, and the transaction volume or the total demand in dollar value. Uh, of this stable coin. So below the C delta, that is the threshold between stability and instability. Uh, below it, uh, you basically have the transaction volume at the minimum level. Uh, you can think about this as the, the, the uh, demand for this stable coin that is uh, so unique, only this platform can satisfy, right? You can set this, uh, this parameter to a very low level, uh, meaning that there's nothing special about this particular stable coin. You can set it to be very high, uh, meaning that uh, th this stable coin is really different from the rest, and you know you can you can you have to use it basically. Uh, well, uh, and another interesting thing here is that below the C delta in the instability region, the lower the reserve goes, you can see the more tokens the stable coin issuers they, they will create, right? So this inevitably will crash the price because as the reserve declines from right to the left, the price already declines. But, and, and the demand in panel A declines, but uh, uh, you know, fixed at the, the, the lowest level here, as a matter of fact, the supply increases. So basically in this case, the, 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 the stable coin issuer really tried to uh, desperately earn some re dollar revenues by issuing more uh, uh, stable coins. But once we pass the uh, critical threshold, uh, then that's when we see the uh, open market operation flip the sign, right? Here, you will issue more stable coins if the reserve accumulates, right? Below the threshold, you issue more when the reserve is being depleted. 
Uh, and of course, once you pass the threshold, the dollar demand for stable coin will increase gradually until the throughput threshold is reached. Uh, so I have some results on the fees, but just to summarize in one sentence, the fee is much higher in the low C region, and it can turn negative into a subsidy when C is very high, especially near the payout boundary when the issuance with the, when the stable coin issuer fails, there are, are already abundant reserves. So if you look at these graphs, right, what we all want to do is to basically tell the practitioners, look at your reserve balance. And here in panel C is the optimal strategy of open market operation. And in panel A, you should have a better understanding of the demand of your stable coins. Of course, you need to calibrate the parameters to your particular protocols. Uh, and uh, but this is kind of the dynamics we are looking at. And the slippery slope of debasement is quite realistic if you look at the recent debasement events. Uh, just to give you a basic sense, some simulation. Of course, this is one pass of the system. Uh, but you can see that if we give the excess reserve some shocks, some of the shocks will be reflected in the token price. It's also the redemption value because the, uh, uh, the PT is not only the exchange rate in the secondary market, we also allow the user to redeem dollars from the stablecoin issuers. So basically, uh, this gives you the sense of this bimodal distribution, right? The system can buffer a lot of shocks, maintaining a stable exchange rate in, uh, in uh, panel B here, but if there is a sequence of bad shocks, and then the system cannot collapse. So the bimodal distribution uh, are really driven by this feedback effects in the low reserve states. Debasement basically implies this information sensitivity of stable coins, this volatility, which depresses token demand. And they, this basically generates lower transaction value and free revenues uh, that, that can, you know, basically uh, uh, allow the stable coin issuer to uh, accumulate reserve very slowly. A slow accumulation of reserves contribute further to the debasement. But in a high reserve state, you have a, a quite the opposite of the virtuous cycle. And then that's why we see the system spend a lot of time in the instability region, but also a lot of time in the stability region where the uh, governance token holders actually get to pay the quite often. Uh, but then if you look at the distribution of the exchange rate, uh, it's at, the, at one almost uh, all the time. But then you have a very long left tail based on our simulation. And that is because of the instability region really showed up with a large probability over the long run. All right, so uh, just briefly talk about the issues of, of governance tokens. Uh, what are the, uh, the things that practitioners need to remember? So first of all, if you have some issuance cost, basically when you issue governance tokens, what you do, you reach out to, uh, to the crawl, uh, dispersed investors, or maybe you talk to the venture capital investors. Uh, you tell them that I have a very good uh, stable coin system. It's a very good payment system in enabling a lot of things like smart contracting, automatic execution of contracts, sending stable coins around. Uh, but right now I have a debasement event. Can I recapitalize? Can I issue some governance tokens to you? In such a negotiations, uh, I personally got involved in some of them. It's very arbitrary, okay? Uh, so clearly there's a cost of issuance. And if you want to avoid that, maybe you just wait until the reserve almost deplete and, and then you can, you can reach out. This is the implication of the model. But once you raise uh, this equity money by issuing governance tokens, there will be a jump predicted by the model in the uh, token price. You don't want to jump in the price because this will basically imply a predictable arbitrage opportunity in the token market. What you can do is that when you reach, when you issue governance tokens, you also issue more stable coins simultaneously uh, to, to mute the, the jump in the price. Do not leave money on the table. Uh, but because you do not allow the price to jump, add issuance, add recapitalization, right? Uh, so what do you do? You basically repack the token price at the pre-issuance price. So every time you do the issuance of governance tokens, uh, the, to the, the, the exchange rate should be repacked downward, basically. Um, all right, so uh, what about optimal regulation? Uh, of course, if you set a C lower bar, uh, it's a requirement on the regulator side, arguing that the, uh, the stable coin ha uh, issuer has to maintain a uh, high enough level of excess reserves, right? Of course, this will hurt the stable coin issuers in panel B here. It will benefit the users in panel C uh, and we can have the aggregate uh, inverse U-shaped total welfare, and we can pick the optimal regulation based on this curve. Um, 
All right, so uh, it's never optimal to assume zero uh, debasement uh, for the stable coin because uh, risk sharing between the stable coin issuers and the stable coin users can be efficient because even if the, the users, they are averse to volatilities of their stable coins, but if a significant debasement event happens, and the stable coin value is expected to recover, they can also earn some expected return by sharing, absorbing this risk from the issuers. So this paper does not suggest regulating stable coin as deposits. All right, so uh, we extend the model to incorporate the optimal margin requirement on the users. Uh, so basically the user post collateral, first line of defense, and then all the reserve management mechanism we talked about before will be the second line of defense. Uh, intuitively, the margin requirement will decline in the platform's own holding of reserves. So, what about the platforms? When they issue stable coins, one major incentive is to build a better payment system. And a payment system gathers data. So, we extend our model to talk about this uh, uh, incentive. As data accumulate, the platform, of course, can improve. Uh, through what? For example, targeted uh, personalized advertisement. Uh, once you observe payment flow, you can analyze the credit, uh, credit worthiness of the platform users, and maybe you can extend some loans. So all this will point to user engagement and the revenue enhancement. So there is a virtuous cycle between building a stable coin, generating data, data help the platform to grow better. Uh, we have all this formalized in the paper, but I'm not going to show any equations here. However, we, we point out there's, a, there's a, a tension here because you want to stimulate more transactions, right? Uh, to, you want to stimulate more data acquisition. This suggests that you lower the fees and even give subsidies. But if you lower the fees, then this hurts the accumulation of reserves. Uh, these, two, uh, these two forces really act against each other. Uh, I'm going to uh, skip to, to this graph. So this kappa parameter in the model is really about how fast data can accumulate and transform, translate into revenue generating capacity. So if from left to right, we basically have the big data technology improving over time. So what's the but what's the prediction here? I want you to focus on panel B and panel D. So as data becomes more valuable, the platform wants to lower fees and to stimulate uh, uh, more user activities, but this actually reduces the reserves. And then this basically uh, leads to a higher probability of, uh, um, of, of uh, debasement. All right, and a lower probability of uh, stability basically. So another concern is that if, if the uh, big data technology becomes more efficient, what about the split between welfare uh, of welfare between users and the stable coin issuers? Well, the stable coin issuer sees an increasing share of the total welfare, the model suggests no, because there are two forces. On the one hand, uh, the, the higher, the more data accumulated by the platform, the platform basically increases its monopoly power. The parameter A here, now being endogenous, is really capturing how unique the stable coin system is. Uh, how, 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 you, how the users can only do something to gain this transaction utility in this system. But on the other hand, there's network externality. So the platform does have incentive to give, some, give users some profits back to stimulate adoption because individual users do not internalize the positive externality of them adopting the stable coin. All right, so these two forces basically give you a relatively stable uh, split of welfare. Uh, so we, we draw the analogy between uh, stable coin and uh, traditional shell banking, and we characterize this agoric uh, instability, this bimodal system. Uh, and in the process, we also want to rationalize all these strategies and want to provide this reserve contingent optimal implementation of these strategies. And the key, of course, is, is to disclose your reserve so that all the market participants can form rational expectation as in the model about what you do and where the price will go. So should digital platforms like Facebook issue stable points? I didn't have time to show this result, but if you increase this ARPA parameter, the network effect, uh, it will bring some uh, stability. We think, well, platforms like Facebook, they have much stronger network effect because they have a lot of user activities that are going on you know, in a, uh, it's a social platform. But on the other hand, this data, data incentive, uh, acquisition incentive really destabilizes the, the price because really you want to subsidize uh, the users and, and this drain the reserves. So there is kind of a dilemma here, right? This uh, stable coins built to, uh, to acquire data uh, becomes unstable uh, due to the incentive of data acquisition. 
Uh, we talk about optimal uh, uh, capital requirement, and we do some comparative statics with all these parameters. I really look forward to Professor Roche's discussion. I uh, haven't seen him for quite a while since the pandemic. I want to really thank the organizers for inviting him to discuss uh, the paper. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yi. And uh, this, this is indeed a perfect handover. So let me just uh, give the floor to uh, Jean-Charles Roger for uh, his comments. Thank you very much uh, to the organizers to give me the opportunity to discuss this very interesting paper by Yeli and Simon Meyer. It's really a topical issue and uh, I, I really enjoyed reading the paper. Um, the motivation is clear, I believe, that we all know that stable coins are private alternatives to official currencies and they are attracting more and more users. Uh, the transaction volumes increase and also the, the big platforms, the internet giant uh, like Facebook are trying to leverage their huge user networks to offer uh, such uh, private currencies. And so they, we need a, a unified framework to analyze the impact of stable coins on social welfare. And this may provide uh, useful policy guidance for uh, regulatory uh, interventions. So this paper is particularly welcome, and it's also very ambitious. It's uh, using a very sophisticated technology, in particular continuous time modeling, uh, where you have a, a crypto shadow bank. I mean, I like the, the title, which has many of the hot uh, words uh, in it. And so um, it's very attractive because it mixes uh, many important issues. So imagine that you, you want to start a stable coin. So what you, would you do? Basically, you would get some, uh, you would invest some of your own uh, wealth, your equity, and then you would attract, uh, you attract, you attract uh, users by offering uh, liquidity services. And uh, of course, uh, you would invest uh, the deposit into reserve because you want the stability. You know, it's not Bitcoin, it's a stable coin. So you want to guarantee some stability uh, to your users. However, you still have shocks on your net revenues. And so you want to control basically the exchange rate between the stable coin and say the US dollar. So it's not strictly stable in the sense that uh, the, the exchange rate may vary a little bit, but it's better than a complete uh, uncertainty like in the case of the Bitcoin. So the interesting uh, thing here, one interesting dimension of this paper is that it introduces explicitly network effects in the sense that users' utility increases with the number of stable coins in, in circulation. And so the, it's a beautiful uh, uh, academic exercise where you mix, you know, those cash management models in continuous time with uh, network uh, models or platform model, two-sided markets, and you. Um, uh, uh, Simon uh, and, and Yeli um, uh, optimize, the characterize the optimum policy of a, a monopoly platform, let's say, where you character you have several dimensions. You have the price, you have the issuance policies, you have the volatility policy, et cetera, et cetera. And, and they find that uh, the policies are not optimal. And so therefore there is a room for policy interventions. And they consider different types of regulation, in particular capital requirements, volatility uh, constraint, et cetera. And on top of that, uh, they are uh, giving us uh, interesting bonuses. That is, they also look at an alternative business model where the users are supposed to post collateral. And they also touch upon the difficult issue of uh, big data, the, the role of platforms in issuing this um, uh, uh, these um, uh, uh, monies in order to collect data about the users and to, to use this data or to sell it. So it's a, it's a very interesting uh, extension. But, so in my opinion, this is a very rich and ambitious paper on a topical issue. Basically, should stable coins be regulated and how? Um, it's very really elegant modeling. Uh, it introduces network effects into a continuous time model of banking. We have very sophisticated solution techniques and interesting results. Uh, so basically the, the main results are as follows. That is, uh, you have uh, an optimal strategy of the platform, which uh, has uh, several dimensions. First of all, over collateralization. You don't want the, 
the platform or the, the stable coin to, 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 uh, to default. So you always keep uh, positive reserves. Uh, however, uh, the stable exchange rate is only guaranteed when excess reserves uh, exceed uh, a, tar a certain target. And so there are two targets. In fact, you have the stable exchange rate target and uh, also a, a second target in which, above which, uh, the, the platform uh, can pay dividends uh, because it's a, it's a private business, so you want to, to pay dividends to, to your shareholders. And uh, uh, conversely, when you, when you uh, have uh, low excess reserves, then the platform uses debasement, which, uh, by analogy with, uh, with monetary policy, it's essentially issuing more token in order to uh, provide some, uh, some absorbing uh, capacity for, for the shocks. So the, the main results are really, uh, I, would, I would say, uh, I focus on two of them, but there are others. Uh, first of all, the unintended consequences of uh, regulation, in the sense that man mandating a fixed exchange rate may hurt welfare, which is uh, not uh, uh, obvious. It's uh, surprising in some way, uh, because in the idea is that it will limit risk sharing between platform and users. So some degree of risk sharing is optimal, so you don't want to have a fixed exchange rate. And the second thing is that capital requirements are unable to completely eliminate the debasement strategy. My, my opinion is that it's a very interesting set of results. However, I would say that in my, in my point of view, the paper is still preliminary because several assumptions and modeling strategies need more justification. And let me give you uh, a, a few examples of that. First of all, I believe that the model is not fully specified. It's too much in reduced form. So the user's flow utility, for example, should be derived uh, from fundamental. Users are, are myopic here. And I believe this, this loses part of the um, dimension of, of monies, which is the store of value. So you want to, to and the specula speculation aspect also. So the, I'm a bit buzzed by this myopic behavior. I would like to have a more, uh, you know, a, a broader horizon, a longer horizon for the users. So, the, the store value is not entirely mo modeled, but the payment function is not uh, modeled either in the sense that the, the transaction, they are not, uh, you, you talk a lot of transactions, but they don't appear explicitly in your model. For example, you have fees and the fees are proportional to holdings, not of transaction. You don't specify uh, when you use uh, your, uh, your stable coin for, for buying or selling goods. Sorry, <clears throat> similarly, there is a cap on the aggregate number of tokens. And you call that a cap on volume, but the number of tokens is the same as the volume. There is a speed, a velocity, a speed of circulation of the money. So I would like to have a, a more a more micro foundation for, for that. And also for um, the, the main equation, which is this exchange rate determination, where PT is result from a, a kind of um, a diffusion equation. It was not clear to me how this was uh, obtained. And in particular, I don't see how the platform uh, can control the volatility. Uh, the other thing is that I believe the network effect has two stylized. And it's very, very, very interesting to introduce platforms, but then you have indirect ex externalities, and at least you would have to have two kinds of users, the consumers and the merchants. And uh, the, the fact that, for example, the, the value for user, for merchants is higher when there are more consumers who use it, the values for consumers is higher when you have more merchants with you. So these indirect externalities, they are not uh, captured. And more generally, I believe it's a bit uh, uh, strange to uh, study the management of exchange rates because basically it resembles the management of exchange rates by central banks in a model where you only have one, uh, one means of payment. That is, you, do, you don't model the competition between uh, other means of payments. Suppose there is a CBDC, suppose there is a traditional uh, you know, physical cash. How does this affect? Yeah, yeah it's really a partial equilibrium setup, if you like. Uh, oh, sorry. And uh, so that was it. Uh, I, in conclusion, I would say that this is very promising, very impressive also. Congratulations on the, 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 what you did. But I'm still a bit frustrated because I would like to see more micro foundations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, George Charles, for this review. Uh, let me see, I think 
there are no questions on uh, the chat. So, uh, yeah, if you want to respond maybe to uh, the comments of uh, Jean Charles, and if I may, I would also maybe add one question which uh, um, uh, would be interesting. You seem to argue that capital requirements are not a good tool uh, because they cannot eliminate the debasement. So, uh, however, uh, they may be successful in raising welfare. So, what other policy tools would you consider then superior than as uh, compared to capital requirements? Um, so, if, if if you could maybe also cover that, that would be very great. And so, the the, the final word is then for you. Uh, th thank you so much, and I want to thank uh, Professor Roche for this uh, great discussion. I totally agree that um, uh, on the on the user activity side, uh, we do not have a very good micro foundation. Uh, it's uh, it's very reduced form, and you know we try to refer to this money utility literature and this and that, try to justify, uh, but it would help to model the transaction more explicitly. And I think at, at some point in the in the in my presentation, I said. Uh, you know, the link between transaction volume and uh, stable coin holdings is there if you are willing to assume uh, constant money velocity. But the issue is that if there is debasement and the uh, information sensitivity of the stable coin varies over time, then the money velocity is probably not constant, right? So uh, we do recognize that because if, if, uh, if people worry about adverse selection, why, you know, person A pay person B stable coin and person B need to verify, well, whether this uh, stablecoin issuer has enough reserves, solvent, and then, you know, it takes some time. It affects money velocity. So th this I totally agree. Uh, when it comes to the exchange rate determination, I, I think uh, uh, we, we need to clarify better in the paper. Right now, we, we do allow as general as possible the users, they can treat this uh, uh, stablecoin amongst themselves. They can uh, redeem it uh, from the redeem dollars from the stablecoin issuers. Um, but but I guess it's not uh, it's not very clearly written. Uh, so when it comes to uh, how the stablecoin issuer can control vol uh, volatility, uh, so th there is kind of a degree of commitment within DT here that we do assume. So basically, at, at any point in time, the uh, stablecoin issuer will publish its strategy, seeing that uh, you know if my reserve will move in this direction by this much by this percentage, I'm going to. Uh, issue uh, this amount of uh, stable coins or repurchase this amount of stable coin. So within DT, there's a little bit of commitment here. Um, and we, we think this can be uh, implemented through smart contracting, but to the extent that this model restrict uh, uh, open market operation to, to any extent, this is the restriction. So basically we have to publish your open market operation strategy contingent on your post shock uh, reserve level uh, at any point in time, post shock, mean, meaning after DT. Um, so we, we really need to make this clear. Right now, it's not in the paper. Um, and and the, the the rest of the points are very well taken. Uh, we are also thinking about uh, uh, you know a follow up paper on computation, uh, whether it's with the uh, fiat money or, or with another stablecoin issue. So now I want to uh, get get to Helmut's question. Uh, regarding the regulation. So here we actually favor uh, capital requirement uh, as, as a welfare enhancing regulation relative to uh, regulating stable coin as, as deposits because uh, for deposits, we know there's not going to be debasement because there's uh, deposit insurance, um, uh, you know, for, for small value deposits at least. Uh, so this is the mechanism to eliminate debasement. But the, you know, through the lens of the model, fully eliminating debasement is not that uh, uh, necessary, actually. You can allow some uh, risk sharing between the platform and, and the users. So the basic logic is this. The platform, at times, can be even more risk averse than the stablecoin issuers. Because if they are in distress state, very close to running out of reserves, uh, they, they can be even more effectively risk averse than uh, than the user themselves. In this case, uh, the user can basically sell some insurance to the uh, stablecoin issuers, i.e. absorbing some of this excess uh, issuance of stablecoin and give some dollars to the stablecoin issuers for them to self-recapitalize. Um, so uh, so in the, through the lens of the model, debasement is, is not something that we want to achieve. We do want to achieve better welfare and that can be achieved through capital requirement. Uh, so regarding uh, other 
forms of regulation, or we haven't thought about it uh, very much. But one dimension that we think we can go is to think about uh, this uh, reserve management uh, featuring indulgence choice of risk taking. Right now, the reserve earns a fixed yield R, and then the risk exposure is fixed at sigma. Well, in the extended model, the risk exposure can be adjusted through uh, margins, but it's not linked to the yield. What if the stablecoin issuers has some incentive of reaching for yield at the expense of taking on more risks? And this incentive is not modeled in the paper, but it's clearly there, uh, you know, when you talk to the practitioners. And, um, and if, if we have this, and then probably uh, the an analogy of uh, liquidity requirement uh, can be introduced into this space too. Basically, you cannot allow uh, excess risk taking in the reserve portfolio beyond the capital requirement. Yeah. Could you kindly conclude? Because I guess we are running out of time. I'm done. Thank you. Ah, you're done. Okay, excellent. Because I just realized we have also two hands raised. Uh, so um, I would uh, certainly offer them uh, uh, the floor to speak. So Tiziana Rosolin uh, and Daryl Duffy, if you could maybe be brief because we are a little bit behind schedule and then uh, Yeli could also be possibly very brief in a response. Thank you. Then let me thank you uh, uh, to the presenter and uh, the discussant for uh, this excellent paper and uh, the review. Uh, it's clear that uh, digital assets, stable coins uh, remain high on the agenda for the future. So uh, this paper was not only very good, it was also very timely in the current debates.